the time. Uh, I'm here with uh, Devendra Chinani and Arvind Sutha, both of whom are uh, Microsoft principal program managers in the Azure team uh, in for business to consumer and business to business respectively. Very pleased to have them with me. Uh, some of you may have expected to hear from Brian Brecken today. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it, So, but we're very pleased to have these two gentlemen with us. They are going to uh, ad address us all about these subjects. I just okay. wanted to uh, go, if you wouldn't mind, to the next slide. I just want to mention to the... Someone's not on mute. Next slide, thanks. So for those of you who are here, one of, the, of those of you who are here, we will be taking a drawing at the end of the webinar. And we will present one of your lucky winners with an HP Stream 7. Uh, so uh, when we contact you, just let us know where to send it. And uh, that'll be your, your prize for taking the time. So thanks for that. A few other words on the next slide, please. A few other words about where we're coming from. So for those of you who don't know us, um, Oxford Computer Group, so heavy focus for the last 15 plus years on identity and access in particular, uh, increasingly as the world goes, increasingly on mobility in general. And uh, we make something of a habit of winning the Microsoft Partner of the Year Award. <clears throat> so six times in total, including the last three years in a row, and a whole bunch of enterprise projects. As you might be able to tell, I don't hail from America. I actually sit in, uh, sit in Germany most of the time, come from the UK. So we, we do projects all over the place, and we do an awful lot of training as well. So uh, should any of that light your fire, then I do encourage you to get in touch with us about all of these things. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, just a little note there from the bottom there. Alex Simons, our good friend at Microsoft who runs uh, is your team. Um, identity being the new control plane is very much being the, the, the thesis that underpins a lot of what we do that without strong and clear identity management and clarity about all of that. Uh, controlling your business and controlling your IT becomes very difficult. An upcoming webinar, you can see the date there, uh, on advanced threat analytics for healthcare, just so that you can all mark that date for your, uh, for your notes. So we've gone to the next. And we've got a series of training courses coming up. Again, some notes there. Uh, pleased to report that all of our training courses are fully upgraded for MIM now, the new version of FIM as, as it was. So those of you who've been looking forward to hearing about MIM, they're all upgraded. And those are the new dates coming up there. Just be aware that you don't have to come to Redmond to do it. Um, there's also remote capability, so you can join online for any of these courses as you wish. Okay, so let's move on. Good, so just by way of introduction, um, we are presenting B2B and B2C together today. Uh, it's quite common that they're presented separately, but the overarching theme that we see here is that one of the challenges that organizations have faced for a long time is making available the access and the data, access to the data of your organization to people who are outside the organization, whether they be business partners or customers or whatever. And so we thought we'd take the opportunity to present a couple of different angles to this problem, depending on the sort of customers and, and partners that you're dealing with. So uh, Azure Active Directory in general presents a solution to the problem of sharing identities. So we put our directory in the cloud for a very good reason, so that all of our various, they may be internal business units, can see the same uh, identities from inside and from outside the network. So it's all about bridging the gap between inside and outside, even if we're dealing with internal identities. So because our people are no longer just inside, so we, they have to have access to their identities and their applications from outside as well. So we're not going to talk about the general sort of enterprise features for internal use in uh, Azure Active Directory of today. Um, but we are going to talk about the B2B and the B2C parts because they're reasonably new. They're in public preview, at least in most cases. And um, so we're going to talk about these, these new features. And I, we're going to talk about B2B first. So I'd like to, to bring in Arvind Sutha, who, who is our, our host in this subject. 
So Arvind, uh, I know you've got some slides for us, but just to, just to start with, uh, would you like to elaborate on Microsoft's thinking about how you started this process of building B2B to sure. angle? Yeah, um, so my name is Arvind Suthar, Principal Program Manager here in Azure AD. We had customers telling us, uh, customers were coming to us with their external access, uh, partner access issues, and in, in most cases believing that we already had a solution um, for this problem, and that's generally a good um, opportunity for us to look more closely at the problem and see if we, if we don't have a solution, maybe we should have one because uh, folks already expect that we have one and are coming to us asking for one. So um, in the case of B2B, there was a, uh, a fair amount of um, interest. Uh, a lot, in, in many cases, customers would have uh, identity management systems for their employees that were fairly robust and well-established, uh, but for their business partners, solutions tended to be much more ad hoc. And you know, in today's world, there is just a ton of value that is created through you know, collaborations and relationships with other companies, whether these are your um, business partner networks that help to sell your products, your supply chains, which help you create your products, uh, joint ventures, or uh, in some cases, mergers and acquisitions, or other kinds of business relationships where it's important for um, people to be able to collaborate, uh, identity management becomes very important here. Uh, so that, that was kind of a little bit of the context of what got us started. Uh, about maybe 18 months ago, I was on a call with probably two dozen customers, and we brainstormed, um, you know, what were the real big problems here? What was the fastest path to the basket? How could we uh, relieve as much pain as possible, as quickly as possible, which led to our, um, our, our MVP, our minimum viable product, which is now in public preview, uh, and we have continue to have a roadmap um, going beyond that. So um, maybe we could go to the first slide here and basically uh, cover what I just talked about. We can go to one more slide. So um, the the approach is. Let me just jump in briefly. Thanks for that. Let me just. Oh, say, oh, 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 I'm sorry. Like Maybe I talked too much. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, no, you're good. I'm going to let you go. But I just wanted to say, if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them into the questions box as you go along, and I'll be doing my best to flag them up when when there's a pause in the proceedings. So ask your questions as you go along if you have them, or of course just save them till the end of these few slides that we have. But feel free to ask as you go along, and I'll try and slip them in. So off you go. Okay. So um, there are two approaches that we have seen um, in the industry of external access management for business partners. The first approach, the, probably the most um, canonical, traditional, right way to do things is to establish federation relationships with each partner. And in this case, the, the partner manages their own identity. So when they leave their organization, they no longer can access your resources, which is great. Um, this approach is does have some problems, though. Uh, you're dependent on your partner's identity management system. You don't have user-level visibility to know at any given time who has access to what resources in your organization, which can present a compliance problem in many cases where um, co company officers are required to have a good understanding of who is getting access to sensitive resources. Um, the expense, so this turned out to be probably the overwhelm the leading cause for this to be a not viable solution is that um, many companies may have sophisticated IT on their own but they do business with other organizations that are small or unsophisticated or for whatever reason um, can't don't have the infrastructure or the expertise uh, to set up fault tolerant systems to uh, serve as a federation uh, infrastructure for for their partnerships um, and then finally the complexity grows not only for um, the organization that has to have a new federation relationship, a new ADFS configuration for every new business partner, but the business partners as well who need to go and touch their on-prem federation infrastructure every time they want to have a new business partner. Uh, and, and so it, it leads to this kind of N squared problem where everybody needs to communicate with everybody and, and is, is creating and managing an ever increasing, uh, increasingly complex configuration in their in their environment. So all of these things lead many companies, including Microsoft, to go with a, a simpler solution where they manage the partner identities. 
and this has problems. Um, uh, you know, I think we, we know about the uh, you know, breaches that have happened uh, in, in the retail sector where companies are managing credentials for their business partners. These um, credentials tend to get stale because uh, if I create a credential for you and you leave your organization, it will be some time before I get around to figuring that out and removing, um, removing that access and removing that credential. If I have tens of thousands of these accounts, uh, keeping track of them in a timely manner like, kind of becomes unfeasible. And because of this, hackers know this, and they target these types of accounts uh, for, for intrusion. And when one of these accounts gets compromised, it puts the entire organization at risk. Uh, another aspect of the security of managing these accounts is in some cases, depending on where you manage these accounts, they might have uh, too much default access. Um, wireless uh, routers and uh, databases and some document management systems simply check to see if someone is coming from inside the company's identity management system in order to grant access. And you might not want that for every one of your business partners. Um, the expense of managing these identities, password management, the sign-up process, the, as I mentioned, the cleanup, the difficulty of cleaning these accounts up, and as well as the overhead of running a separate um, identity management system uh, are, are problems of, of this approach. And, and finally, now the partner, it's complex because the partner needs to remember a new set of credentials, remember a new set of credentials for you, uh, for their other business partners, and, and this leads to um, a suboptimal. Uh, solution. So um, let's go to the next slide. We can see how, how we've started to you know, solve this problem. So we've uh, generated a sharing invitation model. So we have a model where you can invite uh, folks to uh, access your resources. This gives you a way to, uh, pro you invite someone to access your resources, they get a footprint in your directory, uh, it's a user object, and you can take this um, external user object and assign permissions to it, add attributes to it, put it in security groups, assign it to applications, do everything that you would do with a normal user. Uh, so you're responsible for the authorization, but the, um, the, the identity itself, the credential, is managed by the partner. So when they leave their partner organization, they can no longer authenticate um, to use the, this external user object to access any of your resources. So. Um, that's our model, and if your partner has Azure AD already, then they will simply use those credentials to access uh, your resources. Let's go to the next uh, step here, the next step of the build. If the partner does not have Azure AD, then the act of redeeming the invitation will sign them up for Azure AD uh, with a one-step process, and we'll go through what that actually looks like for your partner users in a minute. Um, so let's go to the next step here. So one thing to realize here is that uh, all of these trusts are being created without needing to stand up any new servers, uh, and the partner is the one managing these credentials in order to access uh, your, the, sh the resources that you're sharing with them. Next uh, step. Oh, yeah, uh, can we go to the next one? Ah, okay, so uh, we can just go one more as well. So one thing that, a um, benefit that we have here is that every account that is in Azure AD can be used to access uh, multiple resources, not only within an organization, but across many other organizations. So this complexity problem of I have a thousand business partners, now I have a thousand different user accounts to remember, um, is solved here. You use your one Azure AD account to access everything that's shared with you uh, from, from any number of business partners. So that simplifies the, uh, th that aspect of things. And then the federation relationships, going to your on-premises environment and configuring federation, that only happens once. You only do that for your own organization's relationship with Azure AD. And then you don't need to touch that configuration every time you get a new business partner. And with our SaaS app management capabilities, you don't need to touch that environment in order to stand up um, you know, uh, access to SaaS applications like Conquer and Salesforce. So this kind of becomes a, a one-time operation that you need to do, and then you don't need to touch that federation uh, config on-prem again. So let's go to the next slide. 
and let's go. Let's kind of build out these things. So, th this is um, one of the uh, challenges with the SharePoint Online external sharing model has been the uh, fact that it's it, there's not very much admin control over it. In SharePoint Online, which uses the same underpinnings as Azure AD B2B, um, anybody can invite anyone to access any resource. And what the feedback that we heard was we really want more admin control over this. So we have started with a model where it's an admin initiated model. Admin must initiate um, each invitation and then the admin can control access as to what each invited user can, can access. We're moving beyond this as we go to GA and we'll enable end users to send invitations and ha provide admins with finer grain controls over who can be invited. But for right now, it's an admin driven flow. Um, Security and audit reports give uh, the admin visibility into who's inviting who, who's getting access to what resources. Um, and then I think if we click one more uh, build here, we'll see the Azure AD security heuristics also apply to external access. So scenarios such as impossible travel scenarios or um, access from anonymized IP addresses, uh, patterns of access that appear um, fraudulent, all of these things can be caught with the system that we have in place um, uh, that, that services all Microsoft services. They can also protect your assets. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, one question. We've got a question oh. from Brian who's asking, can I enforce MFA while we're talking about security? Oh, great question. Yeah, so let's go back there. Um, Multi-factor authentication. Uh, we do. If your partner uh, has multi-factor authentication, then that uh, multi-factor authentication can be used when that partner authenticates to access your resources or accept invitations from you. We are working for our uh, GA release planned for uh, first quarter of next year to allow you to impose or enforce your own multi-factor authentication on external access in case your partner doesn't have multi-factor authentication or in case you don't trust the multi-factor authentication of your partner. Uh, so, yeah, does that answer the question? Sounded to me like you did, Brian. Maybe if you have any other questions about that, you could uh, type them in. Uh, Farid, I can see you've got a question about building a public-facing solution with CRM Online, and you're asking, will CRM Online work? Uh, Arvind, is that enough information to answer the question. It says, if an ISV is building a public-facing solution with CRM Online, will CRM Online work? Do you need any more? Um, yeah, CRM, we have been working with the CRM Online folks, and there, we have a guy, I, I, I have his name in my uh, mailbox, who um, has figured out how to use B2B with CRM Online. There's a small challenge in that CRM Online requires you to be licensed and doesn't use the same uh, model that we use for SaaS apps where we simply assign a user to an application. So there is some additional scripting that has to happen. You have to invite the users and then immediately after inviting them, you have to run a PowerShell script to license the invited users for CRM online. Um, but once you do that, then you're able to, um, you're able to use these external users with CRM online. Now, they will need licenses in, the, in every tenant that they need access. So that's um, one one aspect of things that we're looking at trying to solve. Okay, sounds like a good answer. All right, one last quick, quick one because it's there. Um, first of all, uh, Kerry Schuster asks if, if, if these slides will be made available. We'll certainly be making these slides or a slight subset of them available depending on... Uh, I think they're all fine. I think the slides that we have here are all, are all publicly uh, available, yeah. Okay, so we'll make them available. And uh, we'll just, I think, yeah, just a question about what federation protocols back to my org do you support? Ah, so it's a great question. So um, I believe we support about 20 uh, third-party STSs. Um, so things like Optimal IDM, Okta, Ping, uh, CA SiteMinder, uh, of course, ADFS. Um, and so any any of the 20 that we support that support uh, protocols like WSFed, um, are supported with Azure AD, um, yeah, and I can I can get that link on all the supported uh, STSs that can federate with Azure AD out to you, and it, we we have a link somewhere on that. Okay, and I think we must deal with Martin's question because it's uh, pertinent. Perhaps we could go. No, that's not too many builds. On the previous slide, you had um, a scenario where you were managing identities. Uh, already in a federated environment. 
the question is, if we already have managed identity scenario two from the previous slide, and if we want to adopt the B2B model for some organizations, do we lose the ability to manage their DL and group memberships in our on-prem directory? Um, so I, I heard, I mean, are they basically managing their partner um, identities in their own directory? Is that the, yeah, is that a is statement or is that a question? I think that's, yeah, he says, yeah, that's the one they're doing. So they're, they're managing effectively the sort of shadow account type. Yep, and so we, we have um, a number of customers that we're working with, Microsoft included, that are coming to us to say, hey, we have this big uh, set of identities that we're managing. We want to move away from this, and we want to get to a point where the partners are managing their own identities. Uh, in some cases, it's because of compliance reasons. Um, in other cases, it's for, for security to, to be sure that um, nobody who shouldn't have access should have access. So. It, it really depends on how quickly you want to move. Uh, sometimes we'll work with a customer and they'll say, we have 3,000 uh, accounts in here, uh, but this application, uh, SharePoint Online, is a new application that we're rolling out. We want to start using B2B for that and then slowly migrate people over. As we find that they have a, a B2B account, we can go and uh, deprecate their other account and then point them to using the B2B account that, that is their own account moving forward. So we can we can work with any customer that um, is interested in migrating. There are some customers that um, say that they're not interested. They have their own identity system and they manage it and they feel pretty confident about it. Um, although I will say I the key thing is that you could do both at once. So you could adopt B2B yeah. for some of your apps and keep running the shadow account approach for, for the remainder. Sure. Until sure, you're ready that's to right. Do okay. They, they can fully okay, run I think we should be wrong because we've got stuff to see. So. Okay. Uh, so I think now we go just go through the walkthrough. That's the problem that we were trying to solve, and we can go to the next one, which is the uh, where you find the ability to invite external users. You can um, go to the Add User panel in the Azure portal, and you'll see this uh, uh, option to add users and partner companies. If we go to the next um, slide, we see that. When you add a user and a partner company, you're prompted to upload a CSV file. The CSV file contains the email address of the user, display name, some, some GUIDs, um, so that you can specify which applications you want them to access, uh, which group you may want them to um, be a member of, and both of these can be multiple. You can add them to multiple applications, put them in multiple groups. A, uh, some, some, a contact us URL so that they can contact you if they are uh, interested in um, reaching out to you because the email is a system generated mail that you can't respond to. And then uh, it's possible to have a CC email address. So some people say, my, um, my, my partner doesn't have email, but I want him to use this Azure AD account, in which case you can CC uh, an email address that, um, that you can use to walk your partner through the sign-in process. So let's go to the next slide. And I know so, some people will be asking, is it going to stay like a CSV file forever, or are you going to do something more, more useful? We're doing, we're doing lots of things more, more useful. Um, in the near term for our general availability release, we're going to give you the ability to uh, upload a single user. So you can upload a single user without having to have any CSV file, um, as well as having a wizard type uh, model where you can, you can upload a, a, a user and have, and, and you can add, you can invite a user and you can, uh, provide the application assignments and the group membership uh, without having to uh, troll through PowerShell to get object identifiers. So we're looking to make this experience friendlier in Ibiza, and that is what we, what we have as a must-do item for our general availability release in um, first quarter next year. Okay, thanks. All right. And so now once you upload the CSV file, we can go to the next slide, and you can see the status of all of the invitations in there. So you might have a 1,000 invitations. Um, there's a click here for batch status report, which is this green bar there at the bottom. And if we go to the next slide, we can see the actual invitation status report. In this case, it says Garth Board at Fabricam. Um, this invitation was created at this time, and the email has been delivered to the email server. So at this point, uh, we can go to the next slide, and we can see the experience that the partner user has when he when he comes in into the system. So Garth Fort gets an email in his inbox, um, and uh, it basically says, 
you know, this company has invited you to access its application, use this link to access it. If the user clicks the link, they go through the redemption experience, which is on the next slide. And if the user is not in Azure AD, they go through a email verified sign-up process. So this screen provides some context for them. We go to the next slide and we see that they um, are now prompted to enter a password two times and select a region. So an account is being created for them, a directory is being provisioned for them in Azure AD in the region that they specify. Um, and later, let's say there's 500 people from Fabricam that come in to access this application. At some point, an admin can go in, take over the directory, and connect that connect all those accounts with their on-premises SiteMinder or ADFS or Okta or ping system. And now the user has true single sign-on with their on-premises environment and, um, and your resources. Uh, so we go to the next slide. And we get some, uh, you know, uh, animations. We can go another slide, I think, will take us to the, um, yeah, so then we get some more status saying, hey, your invite's been accepted. One more slide should take you through to the resource that has been shared with you. So now the Salesforce is the application that was represented by those GUIDs in that CSV file. Um, you can see that as Garth Fort at, from Fabricam, you are now accessing Contoso's access panel and can access the Salesforce instance for Contoso using your Fabricam credentials. Now we'll go through a few more slides here um, and see the experience if the user is in Azure AD. We can go to the next one, and we see that, uh, oh, that's kind of weird. Oh, okay, so it's just some formatting stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, in this case, he, he, can, he's, he already has an Azure AD account, so if he clicks Accept, he goes to the next slide. And now he simply uses his own credential to uh, access, and he's able to get in uh, in the same way. And I think we have one more slide, which is uh, basically all the information that I just said in excruciatingly more detail. Um, we have the announcement blog post, we have the documentation, we have the launch video that I did. If you can't get enough of me talking about this stuff, uh, a channel line interview and a recent Microsoft Mechanics interview, which was actually the number two most popular um, show on the Microsoft Mechanics show ever, uh, which, is, uh, which is cool. The number one show was by Mark Rusinovich, who's uh, much taller and, and more interesting than me. but um, that, that one was also a good one. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I know that I've almost used up all my time, um, but I'm happy to answer anything that I can. That's great. Thanks very much. There was a question from uh, Martin about what happens if you send to a user whose domain is already activated, but where the user themselves don't exist, what's the sort of feedback mechanism to tell you that that didn't work? Um, well, let's say the domain is activated. if email verified users can be created, um, we will create the user in that directory uh, and then they would be able to create their own password and um, you know move forward like that. If the uh, domain is there and they've turned off um, the ability to create new users or they've uh, federated that domain but they haven't yet um, synced that user up, then they'll get an error message there saying we, we were not able to create your user. Um, contact your admin because this domain is federated, or contact your admin because your admin has disabled email verified user creation. Um, so there, there will be an error message that comes up there that can uh, enable them to get unstuck. Um, yeah. In some okay. cases, they might, ha they might have a domain in Azure AD, and they might even have an account in Azure AD, but they might not have an email associated with that account. And in that case, um, you can use the CC email method to, to copy an account that they do have so that they can walk through the process with their um, invited account. All right. Good. Well, I've just got two quick ones. We've got about one more minute. Uh, will we get to a point where we can trust a remote administrator to manage access to the apps we trust that org to get access to? Yes. So, for so instance, that's, so we um, to remove users without involving our teams. Yes. So delegation and self-service are high priority items for us to look at. We're also looking at these for our um, for, we're looking at these as further out items, um, not in our first quarter GA release, but this notion of external groups where you can uh, invite a person in another organization to define a group on their side that can have access to your resources. So you don't need to know every single accountant over at your accounting partner side. They manage that on their side. Um, that's something that's on our roadmap. Uh, 
And was there another question there? I think that answers Kerry, Kerry's question as well. It's pretty much the same question about the ability for an external person to do the do the management. Uh, is a shadow identity created in R0 AD for these external invitees, says Martha? Yes. A user object is created, and that user object has uh, is, is characterized as a guest, which has restricted access rights in the directory. That guest can not enumerate objects in the directory. It can only see a small subset of attributes for users that are uh, that it's pointed to. If you provide an object identifier, uh, code running under the context of that guest user can only retrieve display name and a photo and a couple of other attributes and uh, and these guest users can't occupy any admin roles in the directory but yes there are they are represented as user objects in your Azure AD directory excellent well look uh, I think that's, I think it's a whistle stop tour I mean thanks very much for doing that I, I've seen your videos and they are extremely informative so I recommend them to anybody who wants more um, but I think we'll move on and uh, thanks for all your questions everyone but uh, and thank you to Arvind. I think we'll yep. move on and let let uh, let Devinder have, have his go. So we're going to move on to to the B two C side of things, which I think, uh, in in a sense, B two B addresses some issues that IT pros and admins have. In other words, not wanting to administer all these all these identities that we have with our partners. Uh, to some extent, the B two C activities that we're going to see address some of these issues. I think that more the developers and people managing. Uh, managing websites have. I'll let uh, let Devinder talk about that. Is that is that a reasonable thing to say about <clears throat> B2C, the problems it's addressing? So yeah, yes, it is. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Devinder Chinani. I work as the principal program manager lead for the B2C effort, and the whole purpose of doing this effort on our side was to give organizations a complete solution for managing not just their employees and partners, but also their consumers. And what we started noticing is that organizations don't want to be in the identity management business. They want to focus on their core competencies. They want to focus on what they're good at. And they don't want to take on the security headaches. They don't want to take on the hassles of protecting users' private information. They don't want to maintain the scalable architectures and infrastructures as they get peaks and uh, demands in their volume and they would gladly have somebody else take care of it for them. So that's where we come in. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, so uh, you're coming in with the with the angle of taking the pain away and um, we know that you do it for consumers already across your assets like you know Outlook.com and Xbox Live and stuff like that so I think you can claim a a reasonable set of experience about managing large volumes of consumer identities already and I think you're going to tell us a bit about how you make that type of uh, functionality available to the broader the broader public so Indeed. why don't you take it away so let me just walk you through a quick set of slides um, and then I'd jump into a demo and um, we're going to do a live demo for you so first and foremost let me just tell you why again repeat why we're in this uh, business, and like we mentioned, like I mentioned, that consumers hate entering new passwords and new registrations on a website. At least I know people in my family when they are faced with a new registration, they're trying to switch away. They want to remember only one set of passwords, and yet they want to feel secure, and yet they want to have all the information controlled in a private manner. And so these customer interactions are the lifeblood of every organization. And if every organization says, hey, we don't want to lose you. How can we make it easier for you? And we want to make it easy, but we still want to keep the security and the reliability high. And we want a worldwide audience. We want a global audience. We want you to log in from any part of the world. So any access and management and identity system needs to have all of these three things. So what we said is that if you want to improve your connection with customers, give us a try to this Azure Active Directory BUC service, which allows you to store user credentials, your consumers' credentials, in a reliable, secure, protected manner. And then the best part is that not only do you get enhanced security, reliability, and scalability, 
it's going to be much cheaper than doing it on-prem. And we've had several case studies uh, of uh, organizations doing it at a far lower cost. Obviously, we know that consumers don't come in through only one kind of mobile device, so it ha it's a heterogeneous world out there. So this our system needs to interact with iOS devices, Android devices, Windows devices, all kinds of web platforms. So the Azure Active Directory B2C service is a cloud-based enterprise-grade security identity and access management service. It's highly available. The Azure data centers are all over the world. I think there are about 17 global data centers out there. Um, we guarantee at least a 99.9% .9 SLA when we go live right now in public preview. And this service is extremely easy to integrate with any of your existing apps, whether it's an iOS app, an Android app, um, .NET based web app, AngularJS, Node.js, um, you'll be able to integrate the service just right with a few lines of code. And I'll give you a quick demo of that. So I'm just going through the slides quickly to give you a better demo. I'll skip through this slide and come back to how we do all of these things instead of just telling you. And I can come back to these slides as and when you have questions. And like it was mentioned earlier, we're going to post these slides so you can take a look at these slides at your leisure. This slide I want to pause on for a second to mention that the Azure AD B2C service is a completely white label service. We enable the organization to have their own branded experience without Microsoft showing up anywhere in the picture. The word Microsoft won't appear in your URL. It won't appear on the sign-on pages. It won't appear on the self-service pa password reset pages. You can customize the pages to make them look and feel according to your brand. And one of our best case studies um, right now is the Real Madrid application. Real Madrid, as many of you might know, is one of the largest sports franchises, sports teams in the world. They have 450 million fans that they want to connect. So they chose our service to power their mobile applications. So right now you could go to the Windows Store, or the iOS, Android Store, and download the Real Madrid app and sign up as a fan. And when you sign up as a fan, what's actually happening in the back on the back end is an account is getting created in the Azure AD B2C service. So even though we are in public preview, customers like Real Madrid have already gone live. We offer deep integration. Just to be clear, the, the service that they're signing up into is Real Madrid's customer customer tenant, right? So Real Madrid has a, if you like, their own tenant now. So you're not it's not like the B2B thing where you're getting your own identity signed up into the cloud in your own sort of domain. You're going into the Real Madrid's own consumer tenant, right? Correct. So what Real Madrid has done is they created a B2C tenant, which is highly scalable and can store 450 million. Uh, user accounts and you as a consumer my grandmother my uh, wife my kids can go into uh, the B2, uh, into their application on any one of our devices sign up for an account and they can sign up for the account using an existing social identity like Google or Facebook or create a new email based account and these accounts are being stored in the B2C tenant that Real Madrid created on their backend. Does that answer your question? Answer it very well. Hello? Yes, that, that, that was a good answer. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So uh, what I was mentioning is that we provide deep integration with Visual Studio for ease of depth but we are completely standards based. So you could use your own dev environment, we don't restrict you to Visual Studio, and we'll be providing you with several libraries so that you don't have to write too much code, just a few lines of code, just uh, uh, copy and paste in many cases, and you're good to go. So here are the features at a glance, and these are all available on the websites that I'll provide a link to at the end of the conversation. Um, and 
we have several new features coming online, but I'll show you these in just a second. So let's move on to the demo. So I'll get out of my presentation and Here's a simple app that I wrote in Visual Studio in like a couple of minutes. And if I click on sign up, pardon my wireless network, it's a little slow. It allows me to sign up using my email or LinkedIn or Google. And let's say I wanted to add Facebook to this or I wanted to add Amazon sign up to this or I wanted to add my own custom IDP I'll show you how easy it is to do that so to do that what you would do is you would go to the Azure portal which is the standard Azure portal for managing any of the Azure services let me sign out I need to sign in with my I was signed in with my office IDs. I'm going to sign in with It's loading. What you'll see soon is the ability to create a new B2C tenant. And I would recommend um, that you try out these uh, capabilities yourself. So to do that, you click, click, click on the new button at the bottom, App Services, Active Directory. And when I create an new directory just like creating an existing directory for your employees or for your partners but at the bottom you see this checkbox which says hey this needs to be a B2C directory so I won't click on one right now I've already created one let's go back to that I call that the brain gym directory that was for my sample app when I click on that directory it allows me to manage the B2C settings now this is all live this is something that you can do right now and not only can you do this you can actually put this into production like Real Madrid has now the administrators portal our philosophy over there was we want to enable admins to manage the entire directory with just clicks without writing code let me get rid of my messages and what you see here are the different axes by which I can manage my uh, tenants. So I can obviously click on the applications blade and I have one app right now called Brain Gym. This is where you register your new applications. When I click on that application, you can see that um, I had set it up as I can define that it's a, either a web app or a native app and then there are these app keys and I just copy and paste the app key from here into my config file and that's it that's all I need to connect my directory to the app when I click on identity providers you can see which identity providers we have right now I have LinkedIn Google Facebook and we're adding many more including the ability to add custom IDPs down the road and of course you can add define you different user attributes so right now you can choose from some standard attributes or you can add your own and so let's say I wanted to add a new attribute called uh, sport um, and then you can create that attribute and offer that as an option on the sign up page to the user I'm just trying to get rid of these plates here so there's sport um, as the custom attribute that I created then the next few blades are something we call policies and these policies are, are um, something that we are really proud of so what our goal over here is that we want to enable admins to define the user journey and to define the custom user experience without writing code. 
And the policies are simply a set of rules written out to an XML file. And you can go and edit the XML file directly through your favorite editor, or you can just do it through the admin portal. So I've created a sign-up policy over here. Here's a simple sign-up policy. I'm going to click on that and edit it. When I click Edit, you'll see that I've selected only three identity providers. I selected Google, LinkedIn, and email. I want to get Facebook into the equation as well. So I check Facebook, click OK, click Save. Now when I go back to my application, that sample app I showed you, Now I'll click on sign up again, and there it is, there's Facebook. So if I click on Facebook this time, it allows me to sign in using Facebook. And I've already got Facebook logged in, uh, so it doesn't let me uh, ask me for all the information necessary. If I click sign up and I click Google, Same thing. Now the fields that are being shown over here are totally up to you. You get to define the experience. Does that make sense? I can go into a much deeper demo depending on uh, time and availability. Let's show you a quick slide on what pricing looks like. So this is also on the web. You can take a look at it. Pricing is based on number of stored users and number of authenticated users. And pricing is free for the first 50,000 users or the first 50,000 authentications per month. And then the higher number of users that you have, the higher number of authentications per month, we charge you fractions of pennies and the price keeps getting lower and lower until a cap. Of course, we have MFA as well. And if you choose to do MFA, uh, we'll charge you separately for that. And I can show you that back in the portal. So here it is. Like if I could choose to turn on multi-factor authentication. And right now, it's on. If I click OK, uh, that's it. It's saved in my policy. If I go back to my sample app, sign up and this time I'll choose email sign up which is start using a local account and let's say I sign up with it'll send a verification code to my email address I'm looking at my phone uh, to look at that email address and I hope it comes in fast enough but you get the idea, right? Um, I'll enter the verification code, and once I send in the code, then it'll kick into MFA, it'll call my phone, and it'll do that entire process. Okay, any questions so far? I think, I think uh, if you were doing that at a conference, there'd be a big round of applause. Uh, we've uh, muted all of the audience, so they can't uh, applaud you, but certainly I think uh, seeing what a developer would have to do to achieve all of those uh, UI and user experience features on their own. I think uh, a lot of people, particularly those running organizations, don't want to be dev centers of excellence, like football clubs, for example. That's you know, pretty right. great. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt you. I got the verification code. Let me just quickly go through this. Uh, but while I do this, feel free to get keep the questions coming. Um, and that's it. I, I can I just enter the verification code, enter all this all this information. Um, create it, and that's it. MFA just kicked in, so now I need to provide a phone number for the United States. You guys can see my phone number. That's fine. Feel free to give me a call um, and send the code. And 
MFA is going to kick in. Okay, so T-Mobile, which is my provider, is going to take some time to kick it in. But you get the idea, right? Um, I wish I could show you the Real Madrid app. Let me, I have that app installed. I'm going to bring it up. Let me know if you guys can see the screen. Do you see the Real Madrid screen right now? We do. Oh, great. So this is the Real Madrid, this is the real Real Madrid app. And as you see over here, this entire screen is being powered by B2C, but it's being customized by Real Madrid. So I can click on I'm not registered yet. This screen is once again powered by Microsoft, customized by Real Madrid. This thing at the bottom corner, passion powered by Microsoft, Real Madrid chose to have that. They don't need to have that. Now, if I click on Gmail over here or Facebook or email, they chose only these identity providers. And you can notice, as you notice, they chose to have circular buttons. So you just need to give us a CSS file and your HTML pages. You just specify a URL link to the HTML CSS, and it's as simple as that. And when I clicked on Google, I enter my Google ID, and that's it. I'd be signed in to Real Madrid. I think okay. that's a very great, great little quick demo uh, to show the various features that you can get with a few, a few clicks. Um, as I understand it, just can, just add one more word about these policies. You've only got one policy, but I think you can have different policies depending on where people are coming from or various criteria. Can you say a few words about when different policies would be applicable? Thank you for asking that question. That's a great question. So policies can be extremely powerful. Indeed, you can have as many policies as you like for sign-ups and sign-ins, uh, depending on what kind of consumers you want to uh, attract. So for example, you could have a different policy for kids. Um, and if the user specifies that they're under 18, then you would have a policy which asks them for certain pieces of information. and during the sign-up process, take them to another site where they need to get parental permission. And now the ability to branch off into that separate uh, site is also a custom user journey. You might then want to pipe these kids or uh, senior citizens based on their age into a different group. And then you can use the Graph API to query those groups and then provide a customized user experience based on the information that you got from their specific profile. So you can have sign-up policies. You can have sign-in policies. You can have profile editing policies. And profile editing is all about self-service password reset or self-service user information changes, which the user can change without admin intervention. So policies, yes, indeed, can be extremely powerful. And if you notice a button over here which says Upload Policy, uh, that's where you can edit your own policy, which is essentially an XML file, um, and upload it. But if you don't want to do that hand editing, then just stick to the admin portal, and just with a few clicks, you are actually defining the policy, because we are writing that XML file for you in the background. And as, and as I think you mentioned it, but just to emphasize it, I think if a, if a dev needs to build a piece of custom workflow that you aren't providing or not interested in providing, then they can do that and use the Graph API to pu pull out data and push it back in again uh, at, at whatever point they need to in their, in their user workflow. That's right. So, so if I... custom, custom workflows within this whole system still using the B2C directory. Exactly. And if I quickly show you how you customize the pages. I clicked on my policy. I clicked on edit. And at the bottom, you see page UI customization. I clicked on that. And it says, which page do you want to customize? Let's say I want to customize the local account signup page. Right now, it's just a default. But you can say, use custom page, yes. And then just simply give me the name of your HTML file. And then different attributes that I've chosen to ask the user and then they would get laid out according to your customer. That's what Real Madrid did with their app. And you can put your sport attribute on there for their favorite sport while they're logging exactly. in or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, very good. Listen, thanks very much for that. We're just coming towards the end of our, of our hour, so I, I want to thank you for your, for your demo. The, the questions are 
that's still open. We've got a question. I think Brian's question about which social auth services were supported, I think you answered that. Chris Jeffords wants to know what attestation capabilities B2C has for protection of personally identifiable information. Do you have a comment on that? I'm not sure I follow the question. What do you mean by attestation capabilities? Chris, do you want to type something more there? While you're typing, while you're thinking about that question, uh, I've got a couple of polls. We typically just ask a question of how, how interesting this has all been. I think I will just quickly ask the question about B2C because we've just talked about it. So I'm going to put a poll up on your screen if all the participants would mind just quickly answering this. Just, just a question of what sort of degree of interest um, there is among the audience. So you feel free to just click on that. It'll be about 30 seconds. It shouldn't take very long. Feel free to answer or not answer. Okay, well, we'll just do the audio while, while that's being clicked on. So Chris has elaborated on the question. So it says, businesses have to attest the protection of personally identifiable information in many cases. So this is a sort of business process attestation more than a... Yes. So indeed, and um, thank you for that question. That's actually a great question. Um, we are working closely with a few customers to do exactly that. Um, that compliance and verification of information based on business regulations or business requirements is uh, something that we're going to pay close attention to. So if you already have a company or an organization that wants to do that, please feel free to contact me. We'd be happy to work with them during the preview process. Um, and then when we go into general availability, um, we'll make it available out of the box. Okay, looks like good answer. Thanks for that. All right, so the, the polling is tailing off, so thanks for that. Um, about two-thirds two of you have voted, and it's a pretty much a 50-50 split between the next six months and longer term, about 7% said immediately. And I guess the guys who didn't vote probably mean never, but uh, there's an interesting stat. Thanks for that. And just as a sort of final thing, I'll just quickly ask the question about about B2B because we have it ready to go. So just harking back to the B2B features that we talked about, perhaps you could quickly vote on that. And while you're doing that, I think I'll just take the opportunity to wrap up and thank you all for coming. Thank you for spending your time with us. But particularly thanks to the Microsoft guys, Devinder and Arvind, for taking the time to come present for us. I know they're open to uh, answering questions. I think I'd encourage you guys, to the, the audience, to contact us primarily. Um, because we don't want to fill these guys' mailbox too much. And uh, we'll, by all means, filter questions through to them as we need the answers from them. So many thanks for attending. Thanks for voting. And we've got the votes tapering off. Yeah, so I'll close that poll. And I'll say many thanks for attending. And uh, do come back for another session.